Okay, Stampeders, welcome back to ECG Stampede Unit 2. Unit 1 was so much fun. Let's do it again, John. It's going to be even better this time. So much better. Jumping right into it. This was an ECG that I had on a shift recently uh, of a patient that was handed off to me, and the, the disposition was admit for new onset atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation, echo, possibly cardiology consultation. So uh, I got this ECG, and the first thing I note is that there's a lot of artifact going on, right? So I would say when I got this, if I were to get this in real time, I'd say, well, we need to get another one. There's too much artifact going on to be able to, to interpret this. But regardless, let's still do our stepwise approach and see how much information we can glean from this. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, rate, uh, kind of slowish, uh, maybe like around 60 or so, but normal. Rhythm, boy, I can understand why they said atrial fibrillation. It does look pretty irregular, and the artifact certainly complicates things. It makes it a little bit tougher. But remember, we had mentioned in the last unit that the best leads to look at for P waves are 2 and V1. So often you'll see that either one of those leads is the rhythm strip at the bottom. So let's blow up that rhythm strip and really hone in on it to see if we can figure out what the rhythm is. And it just so happens that two really gives you the nice, the best baseline of all that has the least amount of artifact. So if I kind of take a 30,000 foot approach here and just look at this globally, what I noticed right off the bat is that there seems to be clusters of beats. And I'm gonna see if you buy this, John. So I think this is a cluster of three another cluster of three and another cluster of three. You buying that? Yeah, I'll buy what you're selling. Okay. I do see some P waves way over here. I see a P wave there. I see another P wave preceding that QRS. I don't see one here. And in fact, if I march out these QRS complexes, it seems like this one comes a little prematurely. And that sort of pattern is repeated over here. So QRS complex there, and then this one, comes a little prematurely and the same over here. It comes a little prematurely and also not associated with a P wave, whereas the other two in that pattern are. So what do you think is going on? I don't know. That's why I'm here to oh. learn from you. Okay. Uh, I, I'd appreciate you to participate. This is like you know, there's two of us here. We're doing this together, but that's fine. I'll take over. Whatever. I mean, so I, could, I can jump in if you'd like, but... I don't want you to anymore. Okay. Your moment has gone. <laughs> so there is such a thing as premature atrial complexes. There's such a thing as premature ventricular complexes. You've heard of PVCs, yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, also, in the same manner, you can have premature junctional complexes or PJCs. And so these would be narrow complexes not associated with a P wave. And so that's what I'm seeing here. Let me kind of erase some of this stuff here so we can take another look at it. So I think that these premature beats that come after two normally conducted beats are PJCs, and it happens in a pattern of trigeminy. Oh. Yeah, million dollar word there. I like that. Three million dollar word, trigeminy. So. Uh, this is I the way that I would describe this rhythm is that it's trigeminy with premature junctional complexes. Okay. Yeah, no, that's nice. Let's go through the rest of the motions here. So rate rhythm axis appears to be normal. It's one and up in one and up in AVF. Intervals from what I can tell normal, and the QT interval you can really see in lead two as well as the PR. And the QRS appears narrow. So I'd say probably normal, although I'm limited somewhat by the artifact. And in terms of signs of ischemia, I don't see anything obvious, but we really need a repeat ECG. There's too much artifact on this one. But suffice it to say that at least on this ECG, you can still glean enough information to say that this is actually not atrial fibrillation. This patient doesn't need to be anticoagulated. She can resume her normal activities. She can resume... Um, Full contact? Con contact sports. Yeah, she can resume her, her linebacker profession. And uh, we wanted to also talk about the the concept of these clusters of beats. And what do you think of when you see clusters of beats like that usually, John? So, you know, we think of like pattern beats by Gemini, Trigemini, Quadrigemini. But then we also think of... Pentagemini. Oh, that's... Hexagemini. All right, now you're going too far. Do dodecat. Okay. Too much. 
So we also think of rhythms that cause group beats like Mobitz 1 or even like Mobitz 2 with a fixed ratio. Um, but we're going to get to those in units that are coming up. Cool, yeah. So this is a, I would call this a regularly irregular pattern as opposed to an irregularly irregular pattern, which is what you would expect from atrial fibrillation. Cool. On to the next one. Yeah, good case. You, you take this one. This is a 43-year-old that presented with chest pain. All right, so looking at the ECG, I see a fast rate, about 125 or so, with a sinus rhythm. There's a normal axis, and I see normal intervals. Uh, we can see ST ele elevations in the inferior leads, as well as laterally. And I also see uh, in V1 to V3, there are ST depressions. And I want to get a little bit more specific looking at those leads right now. In those leads, we see that the R wave is greater than the S wave, and that the T wave there is actually upright. So this whole pattern that I'm seeing uh, of ST changes is an inferior MI with posterior extension. Okay, posterior extension. Talk to me about posterior extension. What does that look like? So it looks like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so in the anterior leads, which is what we're depicting here. We've pulled a, a, a short snapshot out of V2. We can see ST depressions. And now we normally talk about ST elevations for acute MI, but in posterior MIs, we see ST depressions in the anterior leads. And Ben, do you wanna tell folks why that is? Sure, what you're really seeing are reciprocal changes for the posterior wall of the heart. We don't have any posterior leads on a standard 12 lead ECG. So just like we would see reciprocal changes for any other STEMI, we see reciprocal changes for a posterior STEMI. They just show up on the anterior precordial leads. So that's what you're seeing with that ST depression. It's really a reciprocal change. And uh, the, the large R wave that you see essentially represents a Q wave of the posterior wall. So you may not see that early on, but as the infarct progresses, you will see those large Q waves or R waves on the anterior precordial leads, you typically will see an upright T wave as well. So that constellation of findings in the anterior precordial leads suggests a posterior STEMI. So as opposed to an anterior subendocardial ischemic pattern, you might expect to see T wave inversions and maybe not such a large R wave. But if you don't remember that those three findings, then, you know, just if you see ST depressions, the anterior leads, get some posterior leads. So how do you do posterior leads, John? So what you do is you'll actually just continue your precordial leads around the back, adding on V7, V8, and V9. And once you get your ECG with those leads, you're actually only looking for 0.5 millimeters of elevation to just find your MI. Cool, yeah, so you put some leads on the back below the left scapula, you run the ECG, you call those V7, 8, and 9, and if you see half a millimeter of SD elevation, then we're calling that a, a, a STEMI, right? Yeah. And these are the ones that we typically miss, the isolated posterior STEMIs. When it's associated with an inferior STEMI like they usually are, we don't miss those. Yeah, but the posterior was, ones we miss. This one was much easier because you had the inferior elevations as well. I mean, isolated posterior MIs are really only about 4% of total MIs. Um, and honestly, they have worse prognoses because we honestly, we don't catch them because they don't have the typical ST elevations that we see with well, the other. You don't regions. catch them. Let's be more specific. True. And well, the Stampeders won't make that mistake going forward after they watch this. Though. They shan't. On to the next case. Number three, a 55 year old female that presented with chest pain. I'll take this one, John. I'll give you a break. Okay. So what I see is a slow ish rate around 60 or so. It looks sinus. I see P waves for every QRS and vice versa. The axis appears normal. It's up in one, up in AVF. And in terms of intervals, I definitely see some interval changes. There's a, a wide QRS. PR and QT look okay, but that QRS is wide and we need to explain that. Last unit, we went over left bundle branch blocks and right bundle branch blocks. And we talked about when you see a left bundle, it's primarily down going in V1 like this one. So a small R and a large S and in V6, and the other lateral leads like uh, 1 and AVL, the QRS complex should be primarily up going and it can be monophasic like it is in V6 or it can be notched like it is in AVL. You see a little notch there. 
And you also notice the lack of Q waves in the lateral leads, uh, which is a typical finding for a left bundle. And you see some T wave inversions in the lateral leads too. All of that to say that this is a left bundle branch block. So what I notice in addition to just the findings for a left bundle branch block, is that there are some ST changes. So by the time we get to signs of ischemia, I definitely see some ST changes, but not necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily abnormal to see some ST changes in the setting of a left bundle. We expect to see discordant changes. Discordant meaning in the opposite direction as the QRS complex. So I'm gonna let you, John, describe what uh, inappropriate changes, ST changes are in the setting of a left bundle. Yeah, so back in the late 90s, a group led by Dr. Elena Scarbosa created a decision tool to identify ischemia in left bundle branch blocks. Uh, and they named the rule for her, Scarbosa's criteria. And over time, it's actually been modified um, and made a little bit more sensitive. And we're gonna talk about all of these aspects of the rule. Uh, the, the two main points that we want to drill into your heads is that concordance is bad and excessive discordance is bad. If you remember that, you're gonna get most of the way there, but we don't wanna just get you most of the way there, we're gonna get you all the way there, and we're gonna simplify these rules so that you guys don't miss any of these acute myocardial infarctions and left bundle patterns. So let's take a look at concordance first. So concordance means that the ST segment and the QRS uh, amplitude will be in the same direction, which is never normal in left bundle patterns. On the left there, we see ST segment depression associated with a downward going QRS complex. And on the right, we see ST elevations with an upward going QRS complex. Both of these found in any single lead on your ECG mm -hmm. is consistent with acute MI. Right, Ben? Yeah, we typically see the downgoing complexes in the anterior precordial leads like V1 to V3, sometimes in the inferior leads as well. And you would expect to see the upgoing complexes usually in the, the lateral leads like one, AVL, V5, V6. Uh, but it can happen anywhere. You can have concordant changes anywhere along the ECG. And it actually only has to be in one lead also. It doesn't need to be in consecutive leads like your typical sort of STEMI criteria. It could just be in one lead and if you see that, bad. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about excessive discordance. So like we said, discordance is normal in left bundle branch morphology. However, when there's too much discordance, that's also bad. When the criteria was originally created for this, we were, uh, the thought was that anything greater than five millimeters of discordance of the ST segment is bad and would be a marker for acute MI. As time went on, uh, a group led by Dr. Steve Smith of the blog fame uh, starts to look more at the proportionality of the S wave and the ST segment um, in left bundles. And what they found was that a ratio of the ST segment to the S wave of greater than 0.25 or 25% was consistent with acute MI. Cool. So now let's take another look at our initial ECG and see if we can see any of these findings. Okay, so here we are. I'm kind of glancing around the limb leads and the precordial leads. I don't see any concordant changes. Now let's look for excessive discordance. I see lots of discordant changes, especially in the anterior precordial leads. You can see a little bit of discordant changes in one and AVL as well. As well. But what I'm really gonna kind of focus in on are some of these anterior precordial SD elevations and see whether or not that's excessive discordance. So let's zoom in on V3. All right, now there's a bit of a wandering baseline, but remember we want to consider the TP segment as our baseline. So I'm gonna draw a line right there, and we're gonna take a look at the degree, the amplitude of ST elevation, which to me appears close. It's more like three and three quarters, but I'm gonna call it four millimeters. And then I'm gonna look at the S wave and see how big the amplitude of the S wave is. And we'll call that, um, let's be generous and call it seven and a half. We'll be a little conservative, how about that? Okay, so four over seven and a half, clearly that is greater than 25%, right? John, uh, since you're so good at math. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, uh, close to 
well, not close, it's greater than 50%. So there is clearly in proportion to the QRS complex, a excessive amount of discordance here in V3. This is really interesting because the original Scarbosa criteria, which had that uh, one criterion of at least five millimeters of ST elevation that kind of disregard any sort of proportionality would not have caught this. And that was the weakest of the three cri criteria that existed. The modified criteria does catch this. It's more sensitive, it's more specific as well, and we should be using that. Otherwise, we would have missed it. We would have missed this. So what happened in this case? So the, uh, the doc who's taking care of this patient activated the cath lab because of this met the modified Scarbosa criteria, and this patient was found to have a 100% occluded LAD. Very good. Not for the patient, but for the physician that noticed this. Cool. Okay, on to the next case of another left bundle branch block. Uh, who's doing this one? I'll, I'll take a run okay. at it. 72-year-old male with chest pain. Sure. So uh, the rate overall looks normal, 300, 150, 100, maybe just under 100. Um, the rhythm is sinus. The axis is normal. The intervals have a wide QRS, but mm -hmm. the rest of them remain normal. Um, and we can explain the wide QRS by the left bundle morphology, as Ben had hinted at as we opened this ECG. So we have a left bundle branch pattern here. Now, when looking for ischemic changes, we're going to apply the modified Scarbosa criteria, and we're going to look first for any concordance. So as we look around the ECG, I'm scanning around, mm -hmm. nothing in the precordium, mm -hmm. out inferiorly, not much, high lateral leads, boom, there's our answer. So we look in AVL and we see concordant ST elevations in AVL. So mm -hmm. like we mentioned, any concordance is bad. This patient in the setting of chest pain will activate the cath lab. Yeah, it's, it's not much concordant ST elevation, but it is some concordant ST elevation. That's really all it takes. And it's not even in contiguous leads. You just see it in AVL. But again, that's all it takes. You just need one lead and just any degree of concordant ST elevation. This patient ended up having a first diagonal occlusion. So good on the physician that caught this. Probably was not you, John. Eh, maybe probably not. <laughs> I'll take this one. 79-year-old male that presented with syncope. The rhythm looks like sinus. I see P waves. The axis is not normal. There's a left axis deviation, so it's up in one, but it's down in AVF, so that means there's a left axis deviation, which we need to come back to in a minute and try to explain. Let's move on to intervals. PR looks normal, QT looks normal. And then in terms of signs of ischemia, I don't really see much there. We've got a left axis deviation that we need to explain. John, how many causes of left axis deviation are there? Five. How many fingers do you have? I have five on one hand. About the other hand, Anigo Montoya. <laughs> well, I have five on that one. Anigo Montoya does not, though. Wait, so does he have five on one and six on the other, or does he have six on both? It's tough to say. I don't I, know. I don't we'll actually don't know the answer. We're going to Google that later. You can write in and, and tell us the answer to the question of Anigo Montoya. <laughs> So let's go through the causes, the five causes of left axis deviation. Easy to remember because you got five fingers. Yeah. No problem. So the first one uh, is one we already talked about, left bundle branch blocks. Uh, the second one is inferior MIs. I would throw pace rhythm in there with a the left bundle too. So if you see a pacemaker that paces the right ventric, uh, ventricle first, and it gives you a left bundle pattern. So maybe, left axis deviation. Maybe that's Inigo that. Montoya's extra it could one. Could be. Could, it could be. That's what gives him six, right? So as I said before, inferior MIs, uh, the Q waves in the inferior leads that you develop with MIs uh, will um, appear to show your left axis deviation. Left ventricular hypertrophy, so a big thick LV, will help swing the axis over to the left. Mm -hmm. Wolf Parkinson White or WPW, this can actually cause either a left or right axis deviation based on the location of the accessory bundle. That sneaky bundle. Of Kent. Kent and his bundle or how, her bundle how, how did kent get a bundle i don't I, I don't know much about kent actually you should look that up too a, another thing to google later on yeah Anigo montoya and, and kent. kent's bundle <laughs> lastly the left anterior fascicular block uh is our last cause of left axis deviation all right now let's talk about left anterior fascicular blocks oh yeah the the lafbas um yeah sure john everyone says lafba I know that's why I called it a LAFPA. Okay. Weirdo. Yeah. 
So with LAFBAs or fascicular blocks in general, I always sort of had this sort of difficulty in understanding conceptually why the blocks created the certain patterns that we saw on the ECG. Yeah, Just, I, I can see how that would be difficult for you. Yes, as are many things that you can see throughout these units. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I tried to think about fascicular blocks in order to get a much more clearer understanding, I thought that looking at the left ventricle in particular in cross section, similar to our parasternal short view of the LV, really helped me in terms of figuring out exactly what was happening electrically within the heart. And this view that we have on the schematic here sort of helped me through this process. And I think hopefully uh, it'll help you all too. Yeah, so remember, uh, another quick review of the conduction system. It goes from the junction here, breaks up into the right bundle and the left bundle. Left bundle actually has two fascicles associated with it. So it breaks up into an anterior fascicle and a posterior fascicle. So there's really three fascicles of the infranodal below the AV node conduction system. And that framework has existed uh, since really the late 60s when a lot of this work was done to sort of elucidate the conduction system. And it's not perfect. There's a lot of anatomic variation. And some people, John, even have a fourth fascicle. Now you're, you you're making stuff up. I, I feel that maybe you have a fourth fascicle. I think you're making that up. Okay. So it's, again, it's not perfect, but it does exist um, as a framework that helps us conceptualize these things. And it also helps us to interpret the EKG. And so let's get rid of that and just focus in on this parasternal short view and think about the scenario of a left anterior fascicle, left anterior, or, or a fascicular block rather. The left anterior fascicle sort of supplies that superior lateral aspect of the left ventricle, whereas the left posterior fascicle supplies that inferior posterior aspect. So if the anterior fascicle were blocked, that means the signal has to spread from the, the area of the left posterior fascicle to that superior lateral area where the anterior fascicle would have uh, worked to depolarize that region, right? Mm -hmm. So what that does is it creates electrically a, a large axis shift, okay? So as things spread from the inferior posterior aspect all the way to the superior lateral aspect, aspect it, it shifts that axis quite leftward, all right? So if you think about the leftward uh, leads, one and AVL, you'll get a small Q and a large R. Because it's if, going towards that sort of high lateral wall or that lateral aspect of the heart. Correct. Right? Yeah. And if you think about the inferior lead, so where that posterior fascicle lives, it's going away from that. So you get a downward deflection, a small r and a big S. Yeah, that make makes sense? sense. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, we're still using two of the three fascicles. So conduction is still rather rapid. The QRS is still less than 120. It may be sometimes greater than 100, but less than 120. So it's still considered like, you know, narrow. Yeah. Uh, and also, like we had mentioned earlier, there's a large left axis deviation. Usually with anterior fascicular blocks, it's actually an extreme left axis deviation, meaning greater, of, greater than 45 degrees of leftward deflection. And not always, but usually that is the case. And it's really one of the only things, really the only thing that does, that creates that degree of an axis deviation. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. So now let's go back to our EKG of the LAFBA, John. Yeah, LAFBA. And we do see that same morphology that we we're talking about. In one in AVL, you see the small Q, big R. And in the inferior leads, two, three in AVF, you see the, the small R and the big S. Okay, so that seems consistent with a LAFBA, left anterior fascicular block. And I think that's probably what's going on. Yeah, and I just want to make one point that left anterior fascicular blocks aren't really that significant. No. You know, it shows that the patient has some element of conduction disease and is probably more likely to develop conduction disease in the future. But, you know, when you combine it with some other conduction issues, then, you know, a left anterior fascicular block can be significant. We're going to hit on yeah. that, you know, pretty soon. Yeah, so really in and of itself, not that big of a deal, though. Okay, so let's move on to this one. This was a 62-year-old female that presented with shortness of breath. Yeah, so the rate here is about 50, um, and it appears sinus. So we have sinus bradycardia. Um, we have what looks to be right axis deviation. Mm. So we'll have to explain that off in a little bit. Um, and we also have a widened QRS complex, 
-hmm. while the other uh, intervals look normal. So we'll have to explain that off. Um, and in regards to ischemia, I don't see any ST elevations or really ST depressions, pathologic Q waves or anything of that nature. So Agreed. Um, when talking about the widen QRS, it looks to be that there is a right bundle branch block morphology. So if we go to V1, we see that RS R prime and that expected T wave inversion. And then go out to V6, we have that broad S wave there. But what's odd here is that right bundle branch blocks aren't typically associated with right axis deviation because the right ventricular myocardium isn't really thick enough to swing the axis all the way over there. So right. as opposed to like a left bundle branch block, which can swing the axis to the left, the right bundle does not swing it to the right. Yeah, so let's talk through causes of right axis deviation and okay. maybe figure out what's going on here a little bit more. All right, so you have how many fingers in total, John? So I have 10. Yeah, Inigo, 10. Montoya, Inigo Montoya, we has still do at least not 11. know. We do not know Possibly his exact 12. finger number. We don't know. And I wonder how many toes he has. Let's move on. These are like the questions that need to be answered. They're important. These are existential questions. <laughs> Okay, so the cause of right axis deviation, I think you can kind of think of the first five as almost like the mirror opposite of the causes of left axis deviation. So I'm gonna throw all those up there at once. Left posterior fascicular block, ventricular ectopy. I know you don't like that one, John. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I kind of soft. I saw that as kind of like a left bundle pattern, only it's a right, like, okay, all right, soft, soft. whatever. Uh, lateral MI, so if you got large Q waves out in the lateral leads, that could cause a right axis deviation. Right ventricular hypertrophy as opposed to left ventricular hypertrophy. And then Wolf, Parkinson, White, like we said, the Kent and his bundle, they do what they want. They they <laughs> they deviate axes. It's all dependent on location. It's like real estate. Location, location, location. Now you get to discuss the next five. Oh, okay. Maybe the harder ones. All right, well, where do we start? Uh, I really, really like when you look at an EKG or an ECG and see hyperkalemic changes. Boom! Hyperkalemia, like well Hyperkalemia done. can cause pretty much anything mm -hmm. um, on your ECG and is always nice to have in your differential. When thinking about hyperkalemia, I also think about things like sodium channel toxicity. Yeah, so you it do. kind of functions like that. And don't don't worry, Stampeders, we're going to have a few cases that will go over these uh, two topics coming up relatively soon. And those are some of our yeah, favorites. I think, I think they were worried. They're not anymore. Uh, things like acute lung disease, like an acute PE, mm -hmm. can shift the axis over to the right. And then folks who maybe aren't so acute but more chronic, people with COPD or interstitial lung disease, mm -hmm. can have their axis deviated to the right because of that. Mm -hmm. And lastly... Right axis deviation is normal in kids, usually up until like the age of three or so. Um, beyond that, it's also relatively normal in people who are built like Ben here, who are freakishly <laughs> tall. <trying> say. <laughs> I'm saying that you're freakishly tall. If you say Marfanoid, <laughs> don't say Marfanoid. Don't do it. That's really like the roast material for the residents every year. I don't want to give them any more ammo. That's why I've never gotten an ECG. I'm afraid that I may find a right axis deviation. Would you? Oh, and you'd be concerned about that. Have you ever gotten an ECG? I actually have, yeah. I, uh, go on. M m mine's not totally normal. <laughs> oh, please, I, go I on. actually have an uh, incomplete right bundle branch block. Yes, So you're so abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> residents will poke fun at me for that for a while now gross incomplete right bundle branch block no offense to everyone out there with an incomplete right bundle branch block only offense meant to john giordano i appreciate it uh-huh okay so now let's talk about a left posterior fascicular block oh yeah the little puff ups <laughs> that's not a thing no not the little puff ups all the kids are saying it the puff ups no just one, no one's saying that let's make the puff up a thing no <laughs> i'm not so in the setting of a posterior fascicular block now the wave of depolarization has to spread from that superior lateral part where the anterior fascicle is working just normally all the way to that basal inferior part of the left ventricle. And so what that's going to do electrically is swing the axis in the opposite direction that an anterior fascicular block did. So the anterior fascicular block had a left axis deviation. This is now going to have a right axis deviation. And the morphology is essentially going to be the exact opposite of what you would expect from the left anterior fascicular block. And I think intuitively that makes sense because we're heading, our conduction is heading in the 
polar opposite direction. For most people, that should make sense. For you, mm, tough for me. Yeah. So in one in AVL, you get the small r, the big S, which is exactly the opposite of what you saw for the left anterior fascicular block, where you saw the small q and the big R. And in the inferior leads two, three, and AVF with a posterior fascicular block, you get the small q and the big R, which is exactly the opposite of what you saw with an left anterior fascicular block when you saw the small r and the big S. Yeah. Okay, so also remember the, um, it, it, two of the three fascicles are still functioning in this scenario, so it should be a narrow QRS. However, let me let me put a caveat on here. It's it's very rare, exceptionally rare, to see an isolated left posterior fascicular block. That's because the blood supply to the posterior fascicle is more robust than the other two fascicles. So if there has been compromise to that posterior fascicle, the chances are that there's also been compromise to, to some of the other conduction system. This almost always coexists with a right bundle branch block. So you may have seen it um, and you just didn't recognize the right axis deviation with the right bundle branch block and there was actually an underlying posterior fascicular block as well. It'd be really cool to have one of these in isolation. Have you ever seen one in isolation? I have, yes, once. I, I've seen it once. Do you know what would be great right now? An um, ECG of an isolated posterior fascicular block? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen it once. So so pull up the ECG? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've seen it once. You, bl you blew it. <laughs> if only okay. you would save the ECG. That was, that was a stampede fail. <laughs> I, d I didn't save the EKG. All right. Well, the clinical significance of these is really not not much. If, if you see these in isolation, so if you see just a single fascicle that's out, especially for emergency medicine, that's not really clinically significant at all. You don't need to do anything about that. But when you start seeing multiple fascicles with with disease in them, now we're talking like that's that could represent some serious pathology that could progress to something like complete heart block. So when you start seeing bifascicular blocks or trifascicular disease, then, then that becomes more of an issue. But in and of themselves, not really all that significant. And I think that's really what we're seeing on this ECG is a bifascicular block. All right, this was a 72-year-old 72, 72 that presented with anxiety, and I'll take this one. So the rate here is 300, 150, 100, a little bit slower than 100. The rhythm appears to be sinus. It's kind of hard to see, but in lead two on the rhythm strip on the bottom, I can see some P waves there, so it looks like sinus to me. The axis, there is a left axis deviation, so we're gonna have to explain that. Up in one, down in AVF, left axis deviation. In terms of the intervals, there's a wide QRS, which hopefully by now you're starting to get used to this bundle branch block pattern, and you notice that there was a RS, R prime in V1 and even V2, and by the time you get to V3, V4, it kind of starts to go away. So, and, and in the lateral leads, you see this wide S and V6, you see it in one, so this is a right bundle branch block. Now in terms of signs of ischemia, I don't really see any signs of ischemia, but now we've got a left axis deviation and a right bundle that we need to explain. We just saw an example of a right bundle branch block associated with a left posterior fascicular block, and we call that a bifascicular block. And now I think there's another bifascicular block, but this was a right bundle with a left anterior fascicular block, which is the more common version of a bifascicular block. All right, cool. Yeah, good case. Nothing to add to that, huh, John? That was... I nailed it. Very thorough. Okay. Onward, a six-year-old that presents with dyspnea on exertion. So this is an ECG that shows a normal sinus rhythm with a rate of about 60. There's a left axis deviation right? So mm -hmm. we're up in one and down in AVF. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like there's a prolonged PR interval, Ooh. which would be consistent with a first degree heart block. And we also see a wide QRS. And that's due to that same pattern again, that right bundle branch morphology that we see in V1, that RSR prime, and that broad S in V6. Mm -hmm. um, we also see um, some T wave inversions throughout the precordium. And while some of those are expected with the right bundle morphology in V1 and V2, and sometimes even in V3, mm -hmm. they continue on to V4, V5, and kind of almost out to V6. At least it's flat in V6, maybe a little bit inverted, yeah. Uh, that left 
uh, axis deviation, we can contribute to a left anterior fascicular block. Okay, so there's a right bundle and a left anterior fascicular block. So just like the last one, that is a bifascicular block, yes? Yeah, but we have a little bit extra with this one. We have a but little bit wait, more. Wait, there's more. A little bit more conduction disease. We actually have the prolonged PR interval as well. So we can actually call this a trifascicular tri block. block? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and what happens with trifascicular blocks, it's really a, a misnomer. It's not a block per se. Two of the three fascicles are blocked, but the third and remaining conducting fascicle, which would be the posterior fascicle, because there's a right bundle branch block, there's a left anterior fascicular block. So that means the posterior fascicle is the only one that's still conducting via the normal pathway. And that one, the conduction through that fascicle is likely to be delayed. And that's why you end up with that prolonged PR segment. It is entirely possible that this is a first degree heart block that is secondary to um, any other sort of uh, increased vagal tone that you would expect from someone that's more healthy, like you, you know, a uh, an athlete, someone, someone, someone like you, someone, someone more like me and less like you. Oh, perfect. That's what I'm saying. Got it. Understood. You know, maybe I would have a first degree heart block on my ECG, and that would combat my right axis deviation. They kind of balance out, so it's like one is not cool and the other one's cool, and then I'm just kind of back to being normal. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you may expect that in like younger people, kids, not abnormal to have a first degree block. We typically think of that as just kind of some slow conduction through the AV node, secondary to some increased vagal tone or something, not a big deal. But in the setting of someone who already has extensive conduction disease, has this bifascicular block, when you see a prolonged PR like that, it likely represents disease of the third remaining fascicle. And that's what we see here. We also see all those signs of ischemia that John talked about. So this is kind of a worrisome ECG to me. Yeah, so I just wanna make a quick point about disposition of this gentleman. So when we talk about trifascicular blocks and even bifascicular blocks, uh, this is someone who has significant conduction disease. Their conduction system is significantly diseased. And you know, these folks are at higher risk for going into inter intermittent heart block, complete mm -hmm. heart block, um, and, you know, if they come in with anything like syncope or pre-syncope, mm -hmm. dyspion exertion is a good example. These are folks who I'm more likely to keep in the hospital uh, on telemetry and get evaluated by cardiology or EP for possible pacemaker placement. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Especially if they present with syncope, I would say that patient needs a pacemaker. That would be the concern. Intermittent complete heart block. Because that third remaining fascicle just kind of, you know, it's very likely that it's giving out at times. Okay. Ooh, oh, it's time. time. It's, it's time for the stampede. This is my favorite part. We Who's that UFC announcer? Oh, Bruce Buffer. Yeah, we should have Bruce Buffer come in right here. It's time. <laughs> all right, you're going to do all of these, and then I'm going to critique you. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> That's all the way right. this works. All righty, let's do it. Okay, the first one, this was our 57-year-old female that presented with bilateral lower extremity edema who had a lot of artifact, but we determined that this was trigeminy with PJCs. Um, yeah, so nothing you know, glaring at me that's super concerning that they need to come back right away. Um, mm. I potentially keep this person in the waiting room for a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I'm not happy with this ECG. I'd ask for mm -hmm. another one, but presuming that the repeat looks normal, I think she could probably wait. That's fine. This was a 43-year-old that presented with chest pain and had some ST changes. Push the STEMI button now. Indeed. So this was the inferior STEMI associated with posterior extension. The 55-year-old female that presented with chest pain and had a left bundle. So some people would look at this and say, oh, it's just the left bundle, but not you. Not the Stampeders. No. no, no. They will recognize that this meets the modified Scarbosa criteria in V3 and will also click the STEMI button. Yeah, they would recognize this with their eyes closed. They're that good. This was a 72-year-old male that presented with chest pain who also had a left bundle. Let's keep that STEMI train a-rolling. Mm -hmm. Agreed. This AVL, means... concordant ST elevation. Yep. Concordant ST elevations and remember, AVL. Remember the two bad things are concordant ST changes and excessively discordant ST changes. Yep. Both are bad. This was a 79-year-old guy presented with syncope and had a left anterior fascicular block, but otherwise normal. 
So, you know, a 79-year-old syncope is probably going to be in ESI level 2 and at the top of your waiting room no matter what. Um, if I was given just this ECG, I'd probably say next available. You know, an isolated vesicular block is not anything, you know, terrible that we need to worry about right now. Um, so I'd, I'd probably say next available. I got to be honest. I don't even know what those ESI levels mean. Oh. Do you? I mean, Yeah. I, I know what one means. One means they're in the recess bay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, aside from that, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, you should work on that admin stuff. <laughs> this was a 62-year-old female that presented with shortness of breath. She had a right bundle, and we determined that that right axis deviation was most likely due to a left posterior fascicular block, so this is a bifascicular block. Yeah, so this is another, you know, person that's a little bit older uh, with shortness of breath, so again, probably like an ESI level 2. Um, whatever. <laughs> I, I, they're going to be at the top of the waiting room. I, I would probably say next available. There's nothing that we need to intervene on right now that I would say to room them immediately. So I'll, I'll say next available. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good to me. 72 year old that presented with anxiety and had a bifascicular block. This is a right bundle associated with a left anterior fascicular block. Yeah. Again, sort of very similar explanation. Top of the waiting room. Give them the next available bed. Mm -hmm. Okay, agreed. And now we've got this one. This was the trifascicular block. Also had some ischemic changes. And this guy was a 60-year-old guy that was presenting with dyspnea on exertion. Yeah, this is someone I want to see right now. Um, I don't think he should wait in the waiting room at all. I'd get him back and room him immediately. Ah, totally agree. I hate it when I agree with you. Ah. Until next time, Stampeders. We'll see you then. <laughs>